Thank you, Jasmine. Um, and, uh, and thank you, everyone. And thank you, Tanya, for a wonderful presentation. And just want to thank Charlotte and Stevie and Jasmine for um, conducting this session and inviting me to participate. Let me just pull up my slides here. And um, so a brief introduction uh, for myself, whoop, sorry, is uh, I am a uh, recovering administrator from the California State University system. I spent about 20 years as the assistant vice chancellor for academic technology. Um, and, um, and I'm also the executive director of Merlot and Skills Commons, which is around uh, Skills Commons CTE. Um, and um, my goal here today is really to share with you how to think about the investments that you need to put into a whole variety of ways to enable you to achieve the outcomes that are important for your institution, whether it's cost savings for students, whether it's faculty transformation, whether it's uh, bringing in diverse voices, all the points that Tanya made is really thinking about what are you investing and then what are the benefits that are being returned to you. And we often think of this in dollars, cents, dollars and cents terms, but what I'm going to suggest today is the investment side is really around what do you need for institutional change and I'll provide you very specific examples of what we've done in the California State University and how we have led the Affordable Learning Solutions Program. And, and I, one of the points I just want to begin with is we use the firm Affordable Learning Solutions because the transition of a diverse population of people to move all in the same direction, especially in higher education, can be a challenge. And with a lot of open education resources, that's a stage of transition that you have to move people from print to digital, then to consider all types of digital before they often get to an OER thinking. So that's just a, a quick overview of comment around why we use affordable learning solutions as compared to um, an OER initiative. Now in California, some of you might be aware that we have, you know, about 150 campuses serving 3 million students and 100,000 faculty members. And when you're trying to transform that level of complexity and independence among all these institutions, you're really going to have to think in the long term. So I use the word investment rather than cost or expenditure is because you have to think in the long term. And, and when you want to say, if I'm thinking in the long term, what is really the impact that's possible here? And so if you just think around in the state of California, hundred if we saved every student $170 per semester with 3 million students, that's a billion dollars a year. And what I wanna emphasize, that's a financial aid package that we would never get from our legislators to support our students where almost 50% are Pell eligible. When 11% are students are homeless part of the year, and that was pre-COVID numbers. And when 41% of our students are food insecure, again, pre-COVID numbers. So when you're looking at costs for students in the affordability of education, that becomes really important. Now, when you're looking at really the significant scope and complexity of institutions, when there are multiple stakeholders and how do you change the way they are thinking about and speaking about course materials, which has been a relatively unmanaged process in higher education that's been really the relationship between faculty and publishers and bookstores and libraries in, in a way, how do you change the way they think about both at faculty, but how does your deans, how does your provost, how does your president think about this? And I'm gonna tell you that I think 
policies and politics is something that you need to invest in because from those policies and legislation, you can enable the stakeholders to really think in different ways and it brings visibility and power to these issues. And when you're talking about politics, how do you raise the visibility and power to your leaders becomes very important. And I'm gonna talk about the long-term game you have to play in policies. And I'll just begin with 20 years ago, 25 years ago, California got money by presenting a, we call it the CSU Integrated Technology Strategy that led to the form foundation of Merlot, that open library of free educational resources before there actually was something called the Creative Commons license that really became the foundation for lots of our work that we did. 2004, we launched something called the Digital Marketplace to bring publishers, tech companies, and higher education to look at affordability changes, which then one of the issues in 2007, if people are around, the US Department of Labor report on Turn the Page that was talking about the impact of textbook affordability. And this is where CSU's Digital Marketplace and Merlot were recognized as models. I had done testimony along that line. And then the Higher Education Opportunity Act came where campuses had to report to students the price of course materials during pre-registration. Now, let me just say that legislation enabled me every semester to write a memo to our presidents and provosts saying, hey folks, you got to bring the affordability of this of your course materials visibly to the students or you will lose your student financial aid and that kept the visibility and the power of affordable learning solutions readily in in, in front of the leaders on campus and with that priming then in 2010 we launched the affordable learning solutions with a board of trustees presentation and that began to establish a program that then would lead to ongoing funding from an institutional perspective. And you know, Charlotte has mentioned about the importance of CTE. And just remember 2011, you had the trade or the TAC program that really provided Creative Commons licensed material for CTE OER. Now, in California, you can talk about the priority of affordability, but legislation that we got in place to start building capacity for institutions to really discover low and no cost materials. We worked with legislators and I'll just say the key is you gotta work with legislative staff. They have to trust you, they become your friends. And we got money with along with matching funds with uh, Hewlett and Gates Foundation to create a California open online library to make it easy for people to begin discover these that are related to courses that they teach. And the politics on this too was about how do we bring the academic senates of our three um, institutions, the California Community Colleges, Cal State and the University of California. And unfortunately, I'll just say a little fun thing here is in the legislation, they called it the California OER Council. And if the abbreviation of that is coerce, and that is not the acronym that you ever wanna put on a, on a uh, academic Senate initiative where you're trying to get faculty to change the educational content that they're using. So just warning, think about acronyms when you're looking at legislation. Then once we got that going, we had a library, then the next capacity building was funding to support faculty adoption. Once you make them available, related to their courses, then we got $3 million to distribute to campuses to support faculty. That helps produce courses with low and no costs. And then 2016 was the bill that all classes had to clearly identify course sections with zero cost materials. It was unfunded, 
But now you had a chance to activate the demand side of the curve where the students would be looking for courses with low and zero costs here, particularly. And finally, I think this began to set up the capacity where then the legislator and the governor and Governor Newsom, who was the lieutenant governor when we started the affordable learning solutions, now started using propositions. And as Tanya said, the last allocation of $115 million to implement ZTC degrees. So I'll just say that outcome was laid on the foundation of legislative processes and politics that kept the visibility and the power of affordability for education for students at the forefront. And, and that aspect, and SRB, SREB, is one of those institutions that can really help you in the policies and the politics to acquire the funding. And I think what's important and I'm gonna talk about next is enabling institutional practices that scale. Without this legislation, we would not have been able to achieve the large scope of all these campuses that we have achieved implementing their affordable learning solutions and empowered the priorities and accountability. And Tanya's point around how do you measure the outcomes, the benefits of this is a real challenge and problem that you're gonna to have to overcome. And I'll talk a little bit about that too, but I just wanna emphasize investing in policies and politics, really important. And once you do that, once you set up that, I'll call it the, the political context to create priorities, then you have to invest in practices and people. And this is where I think was really important what we began doing with the Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative is we had an annual structured RFP for campus funding. And you don't need a whole lot of money to incentivize campuses because what they need to do is leverage their existing staff and personnel to make this a priority. So with $25,000 annual campus initiatives that was reliably provided, and that's a really important thing when you're thinking about funding your campus practices and priorities, how do you set up a program that every year you enable that to occur? And with the various legislative funding, <coughs> In various years, we were able to give some additional funding. Professional development programs, critical. How you do that in a cooperative manner from a variety of institutions, sharing exemplary practices. And I'll just emphasize every year, you gotta have a recognition program. Celebrate accomplishments at that institution. And part of that is gonna be around the annual and structured accountability. How do you aggregate the benefits that you're seeing from your institution? So that means in implementation for practices, getting someone who is responsible. And so in the CSU, we had each campus had a affordable learning solutions program. Every campus has their showcase where they put what they're doing, how they're working, what the, their relationship with their other partners that they have and the programs that they have. So having that ongoing funding, then you can really create these requirements that allow every campus to build their own program. And again, this is the <coughs> shared library, one to fit all of California. And that way, the California Open Online Library. So it's coolfored.org. We provided that. So this is part of the investment at the system level that we made to enable each campus to begin to implement practices. And an important element of implementing practices is just not what your librarians do or what your bookstore is doing or what your faculty development centers are doing. But one of the critical projects that we set up was when faculty received funding and took on this role of being a leader on their campus, we asked them to create 
an e-portfolio describing what and why they are using OER, why this is doing, and these type of faculty e-portfolios, and I'm just showing you an example. They're one page, you can think about them as electronic posters that then allow the peer-to-peer, faculty-to-faculty storytelling that allows that change to occur. You can work at the organizational level, but when you start working at the faculty level, thinking about implementing faculty e-portfolios. And we have, I think, about, um, I don't know, maybe 250 <clears throat> across all different disciplines in uh, affordable learning solutions. And then what Merlot has done is actually created a portal now of open educational practices of faculty storytelling when their practices around adopting open textbooks, other ones about redesigning their courses with open education resources or career and technical education programs, and how do I integrate OER into that? Or teaching STEM labs. <clears throat> we have over a thousand e-portfolios of faculty sharing their practices. And I think that's a really critical element when you're thinking about implementation, thinking about getting the faculty to tell their stories, to help push the politics and support your policies. And, and with that, just so you know, all these, I'll just quickly go back. These e-portfolios, Merlot's content builder has templates that are free for you to use. You can take out the Cool for Ed logo, put your own institution, and you can create those yourself. So I, I just say with those policies, politics, practices, and people, last year, we saved $77 million in the Cal State system. Collectively, we saved over up close to 350 million. Now, if you notice, you'll see the black bars are really what we're saving through bookstore programs of reducing costs, moving to digital, immediate access programs, et cetera. And what has grown over time, we call them our campus activities, where we really are about our OER, our librarian strategies. And if you notice, even though we started in 2010, it took us basically three years to develop an institutional strategy to begin to find ways to account for faculty using open education resources. We know faculty were using them in 2010, but how do you go about measuring that was a real challenge. So thinking about how you're going to Look at how those programs you're putting in place and assessing that impact is going to be important. And we have tools on our website to help you look at that too, just so you know. Now, cost savings is very important, but when you look at also a Florida study looking at students taking fewer classes, getting poorer grades, when you're looking at institutional returns, Cal State has a graduation initiative, which basically means they need to take more units per semester and they need to perform more successfully. And what we're finding on campus-based research programs, for example, at San Marcos, they're finding that students are performing <coughs> better in their courses that have OER. It's consistent with other research that Tanya mentioned too as well. So when you're looking at practices and serving people, investing in them, you can get a variety of benefits, student savings, access first day, faculty telling their stories and faculty leading. And all this leads to not just benefits to the Cal State system, but we are working with HBCUs with Hewlett funding. We started out with a Cal State support and now we've migrated with a new grant where Tennessee State University is leading that. Robbie Melton's on the webinar here too, that really taking, and if you look at the template of this website here, it looks a lot like the Cool for Ed. And guess what? That's the way you can quickly 
build capacity by leveraging other people's work. And we're working with 24 HBCUs right now of helping each one of those implement their affordable learning solutions program, including faculty e-portfolios, building their programs, providing support for faculty. Now just say Cal State just, and this is a point Tanya made too around, this is a really community effort. Cal State, we incubated the SUNY system. We incubated the University of System of Georgia. Those who may know Houston Davis, who was over in the Oklahoma system, moved to Georgia. Houston came to me and said, Jerry, can, can we use affordable learning in Georgia? So we got you started. And now they have a magnificent program. We're working in India, providing free skills development content for the country. And INACAP was a um, 28 CTE programs in Chile. And just so you know, it's just not about systems, but I'm gonna end up with a bit around a very specific campus that we partnered, the Eastern Gateway Community College in Ohio. They became a partner investing 10 thousand dollars annually to be a partner and just after implementing their affordable learning solutions in one in one year they saved 22 million dollars and how did they do that one you got to provide capabilities to enable convenience for people to discover their content so we built them a little portal and we worked with their strategy on the policies, politics, practices, and people. Beginning with their first move is to move from print to digital. And that was a significant change. Now, uh, just so you know, Eastern Gateway is a free uh, tuition campus and they wanted to make that including textbooks. So that's when we worked with them <coughs> to move the digital to the free and low cost OER. And then they're building new programs now. They changed over 200 courses. And across three semesters, you can see in spring, 7.8 million, summer, 3.5, fall, 2020, 11.2. And you can see their enrollment and the savings that they were able to calculate because they were paying for all the course content before. And now they knew very explicitly what they weren't paying for anymore. And now they're continuing to develop in these areas here to grow the, the, uh, the number of programs that are providing free educational content for their students. And how is all this possible? And I think this first point is really important that make the cost of textbooks an institutional or an administrative problem, not a student one. And then with that, how do you build within your organizations from trustees to provosts, presidents, deans, et cetera, and all the staff, and how do you have a data-driven process and partnerships, I think was really essential where you can begin to share these exemplary practices. So all this, I'll just say in a slide, when we look at our affordable learning strategy for to produce OER, this is the ABCs, all right? Aggregating your assets, understanding what you have to build with on a campus, building bridges, siloing on campus between your, your librarians, your faculty academic senate, your bookstores, your deans, your faculty development center. How do you build those connections where they're working together? Create capabilities by making convenience access to content through technologies, developing the demand. That's where training, professional development, communication, and enabling the ecosystem, that's where your leadership, business models, policies become very important. All right, so hopefully when you're looking at investing to produce those returns, that investing in many elements within your institution is gonna be very important. And you gotta be persistent and you gotta be patient because it takes time. Faculty, staff, it's an incremental change process. 
and they're already overcommitted and under-resourced many times on a campus. So when you're adding on additional work, you have to think about how can they learn to change what they're doing. And so the ABCDEs can help you think through your strategy. And with this, again, sometimes you feel like you gotta lift the world, right? And I'll say, by working together, sharing practices, looking at the resources that are available. We have Merlot and Skills Commons a lot, but so do lots of other institutions that we really can change the world there. So thank you for letting me do that presentation. Happy to open up to questions, comments. You want specific things about how we did X, Y, Z over the years. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer those questions. At this time, feel free to utilize the chat, or if you raise your hand, I will take you off mute and you can ask your, your questions to our great panelists. Okay. While oh, you're- Jasmine, yes, I'm go sorry. Ahead, Charlotte. I, um... I want, I have two questions that I want to bring into the conversation arena. Um, the focus for me, uh, and we talked about it at the beginning, is to discuss OER in the context of dual enrollment and CTE, especially for underserved populations. So that's my direct focus. Well, that's the, the focus for OER here and within the context of the Hewlett funding. So I want to ask two questions and I'd like for discussion from both of our presenters if possible and of course please feel free to uh, utilize your chat if you want to uh, if attendees would like to participate in the discussion as well but the first question here um, the, uh, Jerry mentioned this in the last few minutes of his, his discussion at HBCUs we are often we often see underfunded um, faculty. Um, and so with their many hats that they wear, you know, along with faculty comes um, help with retention. You have many first generation students, so they require a lot of additional support from faculty members. So they wear so many hats, their time is very limited when it comes to developing OER. So how do you see this actually playing out um, at an HBCU. I know you mentioned grants or incentives. So can both of you discuss maybe some ideas you have to throw out to some of our attendees who are who are on the uh, webinar with us today as to how they may fund those incentives for our HBCU faculty? Um, so I, I'm happy to do that. Thank, thank you, Charlotte. So uh, with the our HBCU program, um, we have we have been funding institutions where then they have money to distribute to their faculty. And the way we've set this up is we have, we call them six hub institutions that um, are providing regional leadership in this. So, so they get a, a pot of money that they can then distribute to, to their faculty in um, adopting open education resources. And then we also provide funding, we call them to the hub affiliate. So institutions that are at the earlier stages of adopting affordable learning strategies, and they also get funding. So having a, it's kind of an institutional mentoring process where, for example, Tennessee State has, uh, I'll say, a, a, a significant capability in implementing OER already. And then they can begin to talk with their affiliate institutions and provide them funding. So th th those are very important elements. And you, you mentioned something else that's really important is how do faculty get recognition for this innovation that they're bringing into their institution and the significant benefit for their students. And again, this is where creating faculty showcases where you have the faculty e-portfolios telling their story, raising the visibility of their effort 
so they get recognized by their institution is another important element to your strategy because money definitely helps, but recognition in that process in their tenure and promotion is another key element. I agree with all of the things that uh, Jerry said about um, tenure and promotion and recognition. Um, there are some other strategies that you can use that don't re require a lot of money. Um, in terms of implementation, most institutions have some sort of course or program review and redesign. And that's a process that's usually on like a five-year cycle or a three-year cycle. It depends on your institution and how your um, faculty, senate, and your provost run the show. But one of the ways that you might um, approach um, implementation of OER is that during the course redesign process, something that you do anyway, that's where you would introduce new OER materials. And the great news is that the Open Textbook Library has 900 new textbooks that are all um, proven. And that the whole first one and two years of, um, of higher education courses have been produced already. So all you really have to do is adopt the new textbook rather than create something. And so I think sometimes people think that there's more to it than there actually is. A course redesign process might be simple as adopting a new OpenStax textbook for your algebra course or your intro to college studies, um, putting it into your syllabus, creating the assignments, and many of the assignments you probably already have um, from other, other textbooks that you were using that were proprietary can be repurposed or um, integrated into your new curriculum. And so I think sometimes we focus on the barriers rather than on how easy it really can be um, because the OER community has created so many high quality materials already that are available and adoptable. If you put it into your regular course redesign process as part of your um, regularly scheduled um, quality control, that's a great time to start something new. Also, um, faculty course releases are always helpful. So you might, instead of um, giving folks money, you might give them time. Um, so you would say uh, you're going to teach three courses and your fourth course um, this year will be to redo all of your courses for next year uh, with OER. And so some of those incentivizing activities might come in the form of time um, and integration into your regular processes rather than more money because everybody's like, well, I don't have that much money, so we can't do it. But there's a lot of things that can be done without money. Thank you. Um, I also have a, a, a question that's sort of related to that. So where are we with, uh, in terms of cost, uh, textbook cost or moving textbook costs out of the way and moving the information un into an OER course when it's involving faculty developed research. Can you say that again? Moving courses, just um, many faculty uh, have their own research they developed and it may be in the form of a textbook or other materials that are required for coursework. So when you move that that faculty developed or that faculty research that has been uh, published, how does that look from a faculty or institutional point of view when you move that course specifically to OER? Uh I can get started. Uh, so with, um, if it's a published article, um, Charlotte, for example, so this is where um, working with your library, where if it's already published in a journal, how do you enable the discovery and access to that published journal delivered through your learning management system? So that's again, building bridges between often your learning management system and your library system. And honestly, Sometimes your librarians and your learning management system people don't talk to one another very well. And that's often how you need to bring, if it's published research already out there. Now there are, your librarians are also 
um, have many, many of them have initiatives, they're open access initiatives for their published material, right? And so many journals are moving to an open access, which then makes, makes that easy too as well. Um, now I'll say faculty offer, often author a lot of materials that aren't published, right? In by um, a publisher or a journal or whatever like that. And I think this is where looking at um, what are your current institutional authoring tools that your faculty have access to. Um, for example, um, Soft Chalk is a, a tool that many institutions have that can make it easy to revise and remix and organize open education resources to create a customized version. Or there's H5P, which is a new authoring tool that's out there, or there's other tools that, that people use. Merlot has a content builder tool that's free to use. I think it's providing easy to use <laughs> tools that allow the faculty to, I'll say, minimize the burden of development and maximize the production in something that's usable that then they can make easily available through their learning management system. So, so those are, again, it's about leveraging existing capabilities that your faculty have. Anytime you wanna do something completely new, all right, you gotta have a, a, say, a plan to ramp up that new effort. So leverage as much as you can of what you, existing, uh, you currently have. Um, Rolinda Ruth, um, who's going to be a presenter next month in presenting our case for student success. She agrees that she's there. Uh, they're currently about 65% OER and um, none of the faculty, none of their faculty have created. They have been building courses using existing materials, uh, but they do offer stipends. I have one final question before I, I will have some announcements. Um, the final question is uh, one that we talked about um, during our last webinar. Uh, just a little bit, and that was, what about the pushback that can be perceived as forthcoming from textbook companies? What institutions that rely on or who rely on that textbook, uh, those textbook funds, those incentives, how are they gonna use and other incentives to um, fill in for that loss of income or perceived loss of income? from textbooks as they transition away from hard copy textbooks that the students buy over to free open educational resources for students. I can talk about that a little bit. Um, when you look at the open textbook study from the Georgia system, <coughs> um, they really found that a lot of the students who were Pell eligible benefited and had better grades. They took more courses, they persisted longer, there was more retention of students. And so when you're looking at an institution's bottom line, um, so you might get a little money kickback from the open textbook publishers. I mean, from the publishers, sorry, not open textbook. You might get some money from the publishers by using their proprietary textbooks. But in the long run, saving students money, helping them persist and succeed, graduation rates go up, they take more courses, more of your um, Pell eligible students are uh, retained and persisting. That over time is a, a larger investment and a larger um, return for the institution than any small percentage of the textbooks that you're reaping from it. And I, I also think just in general, um, making money off the backs of students who can't afford it and are suffering for, um, who are in poverty and have other um, issues that they're dealing with is, is sort of wrong. So, I, I mean, I think there would be some reason to shut that down on your campus, even if there weren't other benefits, just because I'm not, um, I think there's some, some conflict of interest if you're making money from students through um, high textbook costs um, there's so many other ways that we can do good and be successful financially uh, by helping them succeed and thrive and um, and be happy instead of instead of um, getting their money through textbooks. 
Oh, that was oh. a question that came yeah. up. Sure, Charlotte, can, can I, can I sure. just add to that? Just, yeah. it's a conversation you need to have with your president and your CFO, because your bookstore often delivers that, I'll say, um, unallocated funding into their budget that allows them to provide support and sometimes for many good programs for students and other ways, right? Um, so it, but it's a conversation you need to have with them. And as Tanya has said, look at the way you get a return on an investment is not always by money. It's the impact on student success, increase units per semester, all these other factors, and the politics of being able to, uh, let's say, where a president can be recognized for their leadership can be worth a lot for them at various times. So, so, so that's, I, I think, um, helps the, um, that transition to occur. Now, I'll also say your bookstore can be helpful in becoming an advocate for reducing costs as well. I'll just say, for example, if you have a Follett bookstore, Merlot's discovery tool is built within the Follett discovery tool that helps faculty find free materials through your bookstore. So this is partly how you have to begin to not create enemies on a campus. Oh, the bookstore is bad and you know they're taking money, but how they can also provide an affordable learning solution strategy so they get on your side and help you reduce costs for those students because you can't move OER to everything immediately. So you have to think about that incremental process and get as many allies as you can to help you work in that same direction. Thank you. And thank you both. Uh, before we transition out, we do have some announcements. Um, I believe um, Jerry had uh, referred to uh, Dr. Robbie Melton, who was a great presenter during our last webinar, our webinar, the first webinar in this series on last month. Uh, they are having a series to begin later on this fall. Um, I'm trying to find it's. Uh, I'm trying to find the name of it's a. It is it's a information on how HBCUs can join the partnership at Tennessee State, and that is in a, in in addition in addition to the Hewlett funding, we are working on to currently under their mandate or their uh, focus for open educational resources for underserved population. And so this funding is sitting part of the collaborative there at Tennessee State for HBCUs to join. I believe, Jerry, you mentioned uh, some of this program. So Dr. Melton, are you there? Robbie? Hello, hello. Life is hello. good, everyone. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Just wanted to share, um, we have a series of HBCU webinars and these webinars on open education resources bring forth and showcase faculty members in the various discipline. So it's more than just show and tell, it's what we call down in the ditches of how to actually teach, learn, and workforce training with open education resources. Now, audience, this is not just for our historically black colleges and university. Again, we're talking open education resources. So if you're interested, please join us. Again, no cost, you're welcome. We have a full schedule of activities from how to teach math using OER, how to um, teach period. So again, I applaud our presenters today. Um, and again, Charlotte, this is an amazing opportunity for us to impact not just the Southern region, but the entire world. I put my name in the chat so that you can just join with us. Thank you. Robbie, we have a request for you to put in the chat box, the link for registration. 
Okay, here's the good news. All you have to do is email me and we add you to the list. So you don't even have to register. We're making this so user friendly that all you have to do is just check your email when I return it to you. Well, any final questions? Okay, we have we have a link in the chat for we have a link in the chat for this afternoon's webinar, which continues our conversation on cost savings and return on investments. We also have again uh, Robbie Melton's R Melton at tenstate.edu. Any final questions? If not, we have enjoyed having you. Thank you, Dr. Spillavoy. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Thank you all for attending and have a great day.